I got a follow up on my email. Uh, my academic integrity email. Um, turned out, turns out, man, a bunch of you freak out. Uh, wasn't expecting. I didn't I, honestly. I, I didn't see it coming. Maybe I should have. Uh, I'm not. Um, anyway, I talked. Uh, a lot of you have asked me things, and some more of you have been asking the academic integrity people questions. Uh, and I thought, I thought the fact that um, <clears throat> that these things ultimately depend on the Office of Academic Integrity would be, would give you peace of mind because it doesn't, um, your fate is not up to in the hands of crazy professor going paranoid. Um, but I don't know. <clears throat> like apparently not enough. So maybe I'm gonna start by clarifying what things um according to my syllabus constitute cheating and what and what things don't. So things that don't constitute cheating, um or things um so if you you use a calculator to check your answer or to graph a function in a problem and to get an idea of what you're supposed to do. That's totally fine. That's something you should be doing probably. Um, of course, the thing is, often I want you to I want you to prove that things are true. So that this is not a cheating thing. It's just that if you just said I I saw the graph, and and this is the answer based on the graph, that's not enough justification because um, graphs could be wrong. But that's not a cheating problem. Uh, that's a math problem. If you, on the other hand, if you go to like symbol lab, if, if the problem is take a derivative and, and you go to freaking, uh, to one of those, there's a lot of websites that do this thing step by step. Uh, if, if the only thing in the problem is for you to do a computation and a computer does a computation for you and you copy the steps, that's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to take uh, your problem and just copy it, um, what's, um, copy it word by word. I don't understand anything he's saying. And also, when I first discovered this, I thought, oh, I wonder if it works. And um, the second limit I tried, it was wrong. So. I don't know. Um, I guess that's also not an integrity thing, but it kind of pisses me off that these things are, are not even correct. <clears throat> uh, also, I said in the syllabus, you're free to talk to each other um, about the homework. I, I hope that you talk to each other about the homework. Um, which is, which means you can ask someone, you know, someone can tell you, I use the, the quotient rule here and, or in the problem where we need to give an example, I use a function, the, I use the absolute value. Uh, but if they tell you that they're not doing the problem for you, if you look at their solution and you copy it word by word, then you're copying it word by word and that's, and that's cheating. So. In the first situation, you should, I mean, that's just something you should do in academia, always cite your sources. You should say, this person told me this, by the way, I'm saying you should say this. That's because I'm not, um, I'm not gonna take points off. Um, if, if I'm saying the things I'm saying you can do uh, is because I'm not gonna penalize you for doing them. Um, So, or I guess it could be a stranger in the, in the internet gave me an idea. Another thing you cannot do is go uh, go on on check.com and copy the solution off there. Um, because again, then you're not doing anything, you're just copying. And, and also, I just gotta say that those are also, <clears throat> they're, they, they, tend to be very wrong uh, very often. 
because um, I don't know who you think a tech expert is, but it's probably someone who passed the class last semester. Um, is there anything? So also, obviously, if I help you, uh, that's also fine. If you come to office hours and I help you with a problem, I guess you should cite the source, but uh, I, I don't need you to, it doesn't matter. Um, and on the web assign, there's no place to cite anything. So um, I guess I guess you don't need to cite anything for the web assign because the web assign, as you know, only requires you to give you the answers. So give the answers. And because you haven't noticed yet, you can give 99 wrong answers before you give the correct answer. And the limit is 100. Just because, um, just because it's the highest number, it lets me enter. Um, so, I mean, in principle, I I think that most of you, maybe I'm wrong, but I think the vast majority of you are not cheating, uh, and the vast majority of you seem to be freaking out. Uh, and so, I, I think. It's unfunded. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm not I'm pretty sure the vast majority of you are not cheating. Uh, <clears throat> are, are there any questions? Am I making any sense? Do you feel like you still don't know what counts as cheating? Yeah, I know. All right, well, feel free to ask me any questions in the future. Uh, I don't know what else I could say to, so, I mean, my only goal with the email was um, for the people who were plagiarizing answers to stop doing them for, for their own good, because the more assignments you have, you are discovered to have plagiarized in the end, the worse it will be for you. Um, All right, uh, let's start the class. Because I have nothing less to say about this unless someone asks me asks me a question. So um, yesterday, so um, well, this is the link to the calculator I have open, but I'm also going to show you. So <clears throat> I'm just keeping it there so that it's safe with the notes. Um, so yesterday we learned how to find the the maxes and mins of a function. Uh, so let's do one more example of that, and, and then I'll move on. So, because this is really important, but on the other hand, it's always the same. Um, uh, I, um, find the maxims, the maxima and minima of the function, um, which one was it supposed to be? Uh, an animal, hyena. Is that supposed to be insulting? <clears throat> I wonder which is the most insulting animal Google Docs has. Uh, and um, well, I this looks in an interval, let's say negative two, negative two to three. So um so first of all this is a a continuous function. On a close bounded, bounded interval, so the maximum and minimum exist. Uh, they are achieved.
this is something this is something you should say when you solve such a, a problem like this um i know some of you love just um writing the computations writing numbers and coming with answers but um you should say why you know things to be true um okay so uh given that this is a that, that, that there's a max and min that they're somewhere and given what we learned yesterday that wherever they are either there's no derivative there or the derivative is zero so um we're gonna find all the critical points um so um let's find the derivative i think i called this step one yesterday the derivative of x cubed minus 3x is an instantaneous thing to do because of the power rule remember when we had to use the definition of derivative to do this it comes so far <clears throat> so um what we gotta do is solve the equation uh derivative equals to zero in other words, 3x squared minus 3 equals to 0. Um, you, you might be able to do this in your head. How does this go? What are the critical points? Is it 1 and negative 1? And zero? Uh, not zero, but one and negative one are the critical points. Thank you, Adam. Um, so if I if I make x equal zero, I get negative three, not zero. If I um, but if I add three to both sides um, and then divide by three, I have that x squared equals one, and the square roots of one are plus minus one. So um, so those are the points where the derivative is zero. Um, and they are, so they're both in the interval. Otherwise, um, I would if they, if they weren't, I would just throw them out. Uh, so, OK. <clears throat> this is a trick question. I'm warning you. Um, what are the critical points? I mean, it's, it's not, I, I'm not trying to trick you, but I'm just saying there's some easy mistakes to make here. Would it just be like, one, negative one, and then negative two and three. All right. Well, I guess it wasn't a trick question. Yeah. Uh, both Dustin and Matthew got it. Yeah. So the critical points are the points where the derivative is zero and the points where the derivative doesn't exist, which um, which is the, well, this derivative exists everywhere except at the endpoints where it's not, um, you can't define the derivative at the end of an interval. Uh, and you can't forget the endpoints because they might be the max or the min. For example, I could have gotten no solutions for the derivative equals zero. Um, so that's when that's the point where we're pretty much done. So we we evaluate the function at the um, all the critical points and find the biggest and smallest. So f of negative two is negative two cubed. Um, a lot of negative numbers, but multiply together. Hopefully, I won't mess it up. I won't mess up the sign. That would be very unfortunate. Three cubed minus three times three. Um, so 
this is uh, negative eight plus six. This is negative two. This is uh, negative one plus three. This is positive two. Um, this is one minus three. This is negative two. This is 27 minus nine, which is 18. So, um, well, just stare at some numbers and look for the smallest one. So there's two, there's two smallest numbers, which are equal to each other, and there's the biggest number. <clears throat> so, um, Why are there two? Why does negative two appear twice? What does that mean about the function? Doesn't that mean it's like a, a, a x squared, or like it it hits the graph twice or something? Yeah, it hits it hits the minimum twice. So um, let me write the sentence and then I'll show you the graph. Um, so negative two is the absolute min. Uh, it's uh, keeps at x equals uh, negative two and at x equals one and three is the absolute max. And it's reached. Can you scroll down when you're writing? It's cutting off. Oh. Maybe I can't. No. Uh, so it's reached at. Uh, X equals uh, three. Okay. So this thing says fit zoom, but it doesn't fit. Jumper is hilarious. Okay, so so that's it. That's that's uh, that's all there is to the problem. Find the derivative. Uh, see where it equals zero. List all the points, and then find all the values. Uh, shortly, uh, shortly tomorrow, uh, no, not tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, we'll see other ways. For example, we'll, we'll learn how to tell a local max from a local min, which currently we have no idea. I know ne the negative twos are local minimum because they're global minimum. But Does that say um, that three is the absolute max or 18 in? So normally, if I say something is the max, you know, if. Um, I, I I refer to the value. So, oh, so I should say it's simple. Uh, right. So, normally the, the maximum and the minimum refer to the to the value of the function. So, uh, I would say the maximum. If I was in the class, I would say the maximum height of people in this room is two meters. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say the maximum height of people in this room is Pascal. Because I'm talking about the heights, not the, the domain is the people and the range is the, the numbers. Oof. Okay. Um, so I said there's there's four critical points. Uh, a negative two and one, I I reach the minimum and and uh, three, I reach the maximum. Let's see if I lied. Um, right. So um, 
well, this is the function we were looking at. Um, a negative, uh, a negative two, it reaches the minimum, which is two, then also at one. And sorry, also one. Uh, a, a, yeah, a one and negative two reaches the minimum. And a negative one, it's two, when we weren't sure what was happening there. Uh, it turns out it really looks like, like a local maximum, but it's not the global maximum because the global maximum is clearly all the way over here. And at three, where we reach 18. Okay. Um, are there any questions? <clears throat> All right, uh, then I'm gonna move on um, to the future. Um, so section 4.2 is the mean value theorem. So, um, the, it's really hard to write and say something else at the same time. So, when you, so what we just did, learning how to find the maxes and mins of a function is something of incredible practical value. Um, the mean value theorem, it's harder to tell its practical value. It does have it. Um, well, no, it doesn't have that much practical value, but it has a lot of theoretical value. And for me, we can get a lot of things which are really useful and maybe which you already believe to be true, but you don't know, know to be true yet. So the mean value theorem uh, basically tells you if you know something about, about a function, um, there's some things that have to happen to its derivative. Um, and before we get there, I need to tell you another theorem. Um, perfect. Dialogue. Rolls theorem. So, Rolls theorem um, is this is this thing that is honestly pretty obvious at this point. Uh, so this is what it says. If no. if you if you have a function which is so the function is to have three things continuous on a closed interval <clears throat> uh, differentiable which means that it has a derivative on the open interval because I'm never going to say a function is differential at the end point. And also, um, the, at the end point, it has the same value. Then, <clears throat> if we have all three things, um, it is guaranteed that there is a point C in the interval in the interior where the derivative makes sense, um, such that the derivative at, Z, at C is zero. So that's the, that's the Rolle's theorem. <clears throat> so let me draw a picture to see what I mean. And I mean, I have a function which is continuous and differentiable, and there's, uh, at the end point, what I need to have is, f of a equals f of b. So that, that's going to mean that the two, the two points, uh, these two x coordinates are going to be at the same height. So, um, so now the question, the question becomes, um, <clears throat> if you were trying to show that this is wrong, uh, 
you would you would say um can you join two points at the same height with a curve that never has a horizontal tangent and the answer is no well the, the answer is that the theorem forbids you from doing it so no matter what i try to do i always i, I always have a point with a horizontal tangent like over here the tangent is horizontal i even i did it really badly because i get i got more than one um so um Uh, I don't know. Um, it's interesting if you try to if you try to draw something that doesn't work by yourself. Sometimes, but okay. Um, if you, I don't know. You try to anything you think of drawing, it just won't work. If you start and then at the same height, of course, if you don't start and then at the same height, it's it's easy to draw something with no horizontal tangents. But if you don't, um, then it's impossible. <clears throat> Does anyone disagree? Does anyone want to draw uh, a curve like this, joining two points at the same height without any? horizontal tangents in between. No one disagrees, no one wants to challenge me. The drawing battle. So um so I can so the thing is um the fact that I can't draw it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but the fact that I can prove it does mean that it doesn't exist. So um So here's the proof. Um, uh, more or less, but maybe I won't do every little detail. But <clears throat> so the proof goes, what did we just learn about continuous functions on a closed interval and a closed and bounded interval? What was the theorem in the previous uh, in the previous section? The theorem from yesterday. So the theorem in the previous slide. Um. Do you mean the one the Fermat's theorem that we learned? Uh, no, I mean the other one, because I'm asking you what um, what happens to a function which is continuous in a closed and bounded interval. Mass theorem is just um, it, it, it's something about any function that has a derivative. So. How does, the, how does the sentence finish? Um, since the function is continuous on a closed bounded interval, are you talking right. about an IVT? I guess okay. No, no, sorry, Adam. Uh, but I forgot. It. I forgot we knew that. Uh, I guess we know two things about uh, continuous functions on close and bounded intervals. Um, the AVT would be pretty boring here because it says it reaches every value in between f of a and f of b. But if they're the same, there's just one value in between those. What I'm saying is that. A function which is continuous in a closed and bounded interval reaches its maximum and minimum. <clears throat> so 
So with all, all the curves that I that I just drew have in common is that they all reach uh, the max and min somewhere in that interval. So now, if if the if the max or the min so then two things, basically two things can happen. Either the maximum is at the, the maximum and the minimum, either they're in the interior of the interval, like here, or they or they are on the endpoints, like here the minimum, these are the minimum points. Um and if we're inside, so is the max or the min? are in the interior maybe then uh then we uh well then the function is differentiable and now we can use the other theorem we know Um, the theorem that says what what happens if you have a differentiable function uh, that it has a max or a min for mass theorem. So what happens to a differentiable function that has a max or a min or points? If you have a maximum value, like this one for a minimum, what happens to the tangent line? Its slope is zero. Its slope is zero, its derivative is zero. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, I wait for him. I was a lawyer who was just a nerd, wasn't even a mathematician. Um, for mass theorem, uh, it tells us that the derivative is zero. Okay, so uh, I'm almost done, but if you have a function, so I'm saying you have a function which is continuous in a close amount of interval, I know it has a maximum a maximum somewhere. If the maximum happens to be in the middle, not in the endpoints, then the derivative is zero, which is what I want to prove. So then I'm done. If the minimum is, um, is in the interior, then the derivative is zero. So I'm also done. So unless, both the max and the min mess with me by not being in the interior, I'm done. So, um, the only, only situation left is if both, um, the max and min are reached at the endpoints and so um what happens in this case how can you so I'm saying you have two points at the same height. Um, remember, f of a equals f of b. That's the, that's the most important thing. Um, 
how could it be that this is so i guess it could be well they're both equal so if one is the max the other is the max so this is the highest point of the function and this is also the lowest point in the function so what is the function like if i just do the highest and lowest points flat line that has no tan line. I feel like there's a joke that I'm not getting there, but it is a flat line. Um, if if the if there's if there's one if there's one level the, the one height and I can't go higher or lower than that, the only thing I can do is um, is a, a horizontal line. So f of a is smaller than f of x and it's also smaller than f of a for all x so f of x is constant and if the function is constant then can I be sure that the derivative is zero at some point in the in the interior? So what I'm asking is if a function is constant, is there any points in there where you can find um, where you can find a derivative which is zero? It all looks like zero to me. Right, that's because it is. Uh, if, if a function is constant, its derivative is zero. In the last one, very few people um, did the, the one derivative of a constant function that I gave you, where you just had to say this is constant, so it's zero. Uh, That from fact is zero. Um, so I'm done. In so is it, yeah. Is this a part of the rules theorem, or is this proving the rules theorem? This is proving the rules theorem. I'm okay. I'm showing you why every every differentiable function has uh where the endpoints are the same has uh a point where the derivative is zero. <clears throat> so, so now we proved this. Um, I mean, we, we proved this is a, the whole thing. I guess I didn't prove the, the extreme value theorem, but um, so this this is very useful. Um, even even if it doesn't seem like it, um, because this is telling me. If I have a differentiable function, there's some point that where the derivative is zero. But if I don't know anything about the, the function, it's not telling me anything about that point. Just from this theorem, there's no way of knowing what the, where this point is. But so this getting from this theorem a point where the derivative is zero is not useful. Um, it's not the useful part. The useful part is when you go the other way around. So um, so what I'm saying is, if uh, say so, say f ugh, is differentiable, which would mean that it's continuous as well. <laughs> hmm. Then. Um, this is role theorem is saying that if f of a equals f of b, then uh, 
then there is a C such that the derivative is zero. So this is what Rolle's theorem says, but a different way of saying the exact same thing is saying um, if uh, f prime of c is never zero, then f of a has to be different from f of b. That's um, that's that's very interesting um, because you can uh, there's I mean I'll do an example but there's a lot of functions where you could apply this to include that it never has the same value twice for example uh, it, you could include that it's one to one so um, so this is just this is just how logic works if i say if a thing happens if a then b that means that if not b then not a if i say uh if uh i can only think of very dramatic examples but we live in very dramatic times if i say if you're correct then i'm the pope that's the way of saying you're not correct. Why, why, why is that true? Because I'm not the Pope, which must mean that you're not correct. Because uh, if you were correct, I would have to be the Pope. Um, if I say uh, if it if it rains, the floor outside is wet. Uh, that's true. If you see the floor outside is dry, then you know that it didn't rain. If you see that the derivative. The Pope is somewhere else right now, probably. Or maybe I'm the Pope. I don't know. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a bad example because maybe I could be the Pope. Good point. Um, the um, anyway, if 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 it rain if it rains, the floor is wet. If the floor is dry, that means it, it can't have rained. Uh, if so, here raining is having two equal values of the function. The floor being wet is having a derivative which is zero. If you have no derivative that is zero, then never could you have had two points where you reach the same um, uh, where you reach the same value. So, um, for example, now we can uh, we can show that. Um, this an equation like this has only one solution are you kids playing among us all day or is it just kids in spain Okay, uh, I don't know why I asked that. <clears throat> so, uh, so, um, so we have this equation. So, this is not an equation. Um, well, this is not an equation. <laughs> this is an equation. This is not an equation I want to solve um, because. Okay. Uh, I mean, now we're just celebrating the Pope. I guess, I guess, um, we don't get many chances to do that, honestly. <clears throat> I'm just, <laughs> uh, I can't think, I can't not think that I'm being recorded. Um, so, um, this is an equation that has a formula to solve it, and it's, I mean, I could get it, it's on Google. I don't want, I don't want to do that. Even if I had the formula on hand, it would be terrible. I want to use, um, I want to use the, the intermediate value theorem.
I'm just going to say I'm glad that in most countries we didn't have to wait for the Pope to let us have rights to have them legally. Like, you think we've advanced from that? Probably. Um, I don't know why I'm encouraging this conversation. <clears throat> All right. So, um, intermediate value theorem says, uh, well, take this function, it's x cubed plus x plus one. F of negative three, for example, I, I, I look at x cubed and I know it's approaching negative infinity. So F of negative three is a negative number. It's negative something, negative 20 f of zero is one, which is positive. The intermediate value theorem says that the function reaches this intermediate value between uh, negative 20 and one uh, at least once, it could be a bunch of times. Uh, so the the new part, the part that I, we can do now is uh, we can we can know that there is uh, just one solution using the derivative. So let's look at the derivative. Um, three, it's three x squared plus x plus one. It's the derivative of x cubed plus x. The one doesn't do anything. Uh, so the derivative of x cubed is three x squared. The derivative of x is one. Uh, so this function is a square plus one. What can you tell me about this function in 30 seconds? Nah. You um, can tell me. Yeah. Uh, well, it won't be zero. It won't be zero. It's not gonna be zero because three x squared is at least zero. So when I add one, it's definitely positive. F prime of x is never zero. This means that, so now um, if we had two different points where that, that were solutions to the equation with f of a equals zero equals f of b, Rolle's theorem would say, that f prime of c is zero somewhere. Uh, but, um, but indeed, I am not the Pope. Um, the proof of that is that I am a square plus one. Uh, I believed in equal rights before this week. Um, but uh, it's not true. So if the conclusion is wrong, the premise must have, is, uh, must have been wrong. So there's only one solution. And knowing that an equation has only one solution is very useful. If, you, you know, if you're looking for a quantity that's a solution to one equation, uh, it's good to know that you didn't find the wrong solution, that you didn't find the um, the thing you're not looking for. All right. Uh, have a good weekend. Uh, I'm going to.